our next talk is by Professor Rathul Das Gupta. So Rathul is an old friend of mine. We both did our PhDs together. He worked at Infosys and then he got fed up with it and came to uh, Bangalore uh, JNC to do a PhD with Rama. And uh, he spent a few years at um, at the Weizmann Institute with uh, Professor Prokachia, and then now he's back in India at, as an associate professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at IIT Bombay. So, Rathul, uh, it's all yours now. Yeah. So, thanks a lot, Harish, for the introduction. So, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Thanks. So, thanks a lot, Harish, for the introduction. So, it's a it's a wonderful opportunity to to be speaking here. So, first of all, thank you, Anubhav and Mahesh, for the invitation to be talking here. And of course, uh, very happy birthday, happy 60th birthday to you, Professor Bala. Uh, I have not had the opportunity of meeting you, but uh, with right now the COVID situation seeming like under control here, hopefully we will be able to travel soon and be able to meet you. So uh, very happy birthday to you once again. So uh, the work that I'm going to be talking on is about finite amplitude surface waves and dimple and jet formation in there. So, we have been doing this work for a few years now. This work originally started with uh, my uh, first PhD student, Palash, uh, who is right now a postdoc with Professor Luke Dyke. I think Professor Luke Dyke is uh, speaking tomorrow in this meeting. And then we have continued some recent work with uh, two more students, uh, Shashwata Basak, who is a former MTech student, and Lohit Payal, who is a current PhD student. So I'm going to be dis discussing some, uh, some of the recent work that we have been doing here. And so, So let me start by showing you a movie and uh, I'll show you the video, but let me first explain what you're going to see in the video. So you're going to see a surface wave in a cylindrical container. So I'm going to show you a simulation of a surface wave in a cylindrical container. The initial condition is we have quiescent fluid above and below. I'm just perturbing the surface in the form of a Bessel function. Okay? The reason why we take a Bessel function is because in this cylindrical geometry, that's an eigenmode of the linearized system. So what is inside the argument of the Bessel function is basically this number LQ. Q will be five as far as this talk is concerned. So it turns out that because this geometry is a cylindrical geometry and there are walls on the sides. So we have to satisfy some no penetration conditions at the side walls. And so it can be shown easily that uh, the, the set of numbers LQ has to come from the roots of the Bessel function J1. So it's basically just a set of numbers. And so we will just choose L5 and L5 is approximately 16. So what we can do here is we, by choosing L5 suitably for a given radius of the container, by choosing L5 suitably, one can alter the wavelength of the perturbation that one puts. Note that Bessel function is not strictly a, exactly a periodic function, but it's an oscillatory function. Now we are just going to initialize this. And so note here that there is a parameter A, A0. You can think of this ratio LQ by R0 as some kind of a wave number. It has the dimensions of one by length. And so as far as these simulations are concerned, these are axisymmetric inviscid simulations. So the contact line here will just satisfy a free edge boundary condition, which basically means that uh, the, at the edge of the container, the, it will always be a maxima or a minima of the vessel move. Okay? That, that is a constraint that we impose. And so it will always move up and down at 90 degrees with a contact angle of 90 degrees, but it's free to move otherwise. And so these simulations are actually governed by two non-dimensional parameters. One of them is a measure of non-linearity, which involves this A0 and R0 and this LQ. And the other is a measure of the relative strength of surface tension to gravity. In this simulation, we have both. And the perturbation has been chosen. The perturbation wavelength, which is controlled by LQ, has been chosen in such a way that uh, it is basically a capillary gravity wave. It's affected almost equally by both capillarity and gravity. Now, what we are, what I'm going to show you now is a simulation where this value of epsilon is relatively large. So this will be about 1.7 now, and you'll see what will happen. So that's my initial perturbation. And one expects uh, a standing wave kind of a pattern if you, if you just uh, solve the equations of motion. But at large values of epsilon, something interesting will show up. So this goes a little bit slow. So I'm just going to fast forward it. And so you will see that from the center of this axis emerges a jet-like structure, which goes, shoots up. It actually shoots, it can rise to a height greater than the initial perturbation and it ejects a droplet at the center. So now this is what uh, we are interested in. And we are basically interested in understanding the mechanics of this phenomena 
and what role does nonlinearity play in this? I'll show you shortly that this is a, actually a strongly nonlinear phenomena. And so let's see how we can understand it and what, how do we model it? So, so let's now zoom in into the numerical simulations. So this is, I have sh shown a few snapshots here. So this one is for a slightly smaller value of epsilon, epsilon 1.2. And this one is for 1.7. This is actually the, the slice of the video that I just showed you. So let's first look at epsilon 1.2. So you can see that this blue line is basically my uh, vessel mode with which I started the perturbation. It actually goes downwards as it evolves in time. And then it becomes a trough. The trough is not shown here. But as the trough moves upwards, it forms this slight dimple-like structure, which actually emerges and goes forward and forms this blob-like structure. Now you can, what happens if we increase epsilon even further, you can see that it becomes more and more uh, aggravated. So we still have the, this blue line is the initial condition. Then it goes down to a, uh, to a trough and then the trough, the, the, the axis, the point at r equal to zero deforms into a very sharp dimple-like structure, which eventually produces this jet, which can rise to a height quite a bit more than the initial perturbation height at this point. Now, I have to mention here that this, this dimple-like structure, which is seen in both the cases here, the dimple is a bit wider. Here, the dimple huh? is very narrow. So these dimple-like structures are seen not just for epsilon greater than one, but they actually start emerging for epsilon as small as 0.5. So what we wish to do is we wish to construct, you can clearly see that this is a nonlinear event because we started with a single eigenmode of the system. And so if there was a linear phenomena, then there was no way energy could be, all my energy is injected into one single mode. And so if you look at the interface shape at this instant of time with that small dimple here, you can see that this is not a vessel function. Okay, this is not a single eigenmode anymore. So clearly there has been a transfer of energy into other modes of the system which cannot happen through a linear uh, linear mechanism. And so we have to look for nonlinear mechanisms to understand what is happening here. So with that background, let me now go over to an analogous problem. So I don't know how to, uh, Harish, can you just tell me how to, uh, is this blocking the uh, part of the slide? No, everything is good. Okay, uh, yeah, fine. So on the left, I have just taken two classical studies of uh, bubble bursting. And uh, the reason why I'm talking about bubble bursting is because uh, very analogous phenomena are also seen in bubble bursting. Okay, so such things are also known for Worthington jets. So these two are taken from two old studies. One is from 1954 and one is from 1972. This is actually an uh, experiment where the, the bubble collapsed. So initially there is a bubble, which is this, and then it bursts. And then you can see those capillary waves, which are focusing here. And then you see that little bump like structure, which is forming and which gives rise to a jet. And this jet under certain conditions can eject droplets from its tip. Uh, in, in a numerical simulation in 2002 of the axisymmetric Navier-Stokes equation, this was captured very beautifully by these authors. And uh, here you can see that there is this small dimple like structure, very sharp here, which is also seen. now. Um, you can, this, this should basically tell you that this is very analogous to what we are seeing. We have, instead of a bubble, we have a single vessel function, and then that forms a trough. And from the base of the trough, if epsilon is uh, not too small, from the base of the trough emanates a small dimple. And if epsilon is sufficiently large, that dimple actually becomes a jet, which can actually eject drops from its tip. So in that sense, this phenomena appear the same. So what we're trying to understand is how analogous are the two phenomena and what can we understand or what can we conclude about this by studying the other one. Now the attractive feature of the Bessel mode problem is that, that we start with only one mode in the system. And so it becomes amenable to analytical calculation. He, solving the initial value problem for this kind of a part of shape of the interface can be done numerically, but it is quite a hard task analytically. Okay, so this is what I'm going to show. And I'm going to just walk you through the uh, weekly nonlinear calculation that we have recently done. So just as a reminder of the geometry, so we are going to be operating in a cylindrical axisymmetric coordinate system. The coordinate system is centered at the center of the cylinder at r equal to zero here, and it's all axisymmetric. And we are going to be restricting ourselves to the inviscid irrotational approximation. So once again, this is my initial condition that I've already mentioned. And so we have a perturbation velocity potential. The base state here is just of rest and I'm just putting an initial deformation. So this is my perturbation velocity potential. It's governed by the Laplace equation written in cylindrical axisymmetric coordinates. 
we have boundary conditions and because we want to solve the problem we want to solve this problem up to order epsilon square recall epsilon is a measure of non linearity you will see epsilon appearing in the initial conditions these are scaled equations these are actually non dimensionalized suitably and so this is a boundary condition which is obtained at the surface using a combination of the kinematic boundary condition and the bernoulli equation applied at the free surface similarly we actually have another bernoulli equation this is a combination of the kinematic boundary condition and bernoulli equation this is the bernoulli equation with the surface tension uh, with the pressure jump condition at the interface uh, you can notice that there is a sigma here recall that there were two non dimensional parameters in the system one was sigma and one was epsilon in this calculation i am going to assume that sigma is an order one quantity and epsilon is going to be treated as a small parameter so let's see uh, what can we do with this so this has to be imposed we are imposing a volume conserving perturbation so that just says that the volume of the perturbation is conserved and in addition we also have boundary conditions at the axis of symmetry and at the edge of the at the outer periphery of the cylinder these are basically just boundary conditions written in scale coordinates so this is basically a scaled version of the boundary condition at the outer edge as i said earlier there is a free edge boundary condition so the contact angle is always 90 degree but the contact point is free to move all along the surface of the cylinder now with this we have to add suitable initial conditions our initial conditions are very simple it just says that my initial uh, mode is a single fourier is a single fourier bessel mode of, of the form this and there is this parameter sitting here and i'm going to treat this as a small parameter and i'm going to do a perturbation expansion up to order epsilon square so let's proceed so we do this usual perturbative calculation and we actually want to go to, to order epsilon square now for this i will just tell you briefly that uh, we need actually need to take the calculation up to order epsilon cube because there are these resonant forcing terms which appear which need which need to be eliminated and that actually determines the non linear correction to the frequency of the, uh, the various modes in the system so with those expansions if you just plug them in into the system then it you we just get a laplace equation so i is a index which takes the value 1 2 3 1 will be the linear order calculation 2 will be the first non linear order and we don't intend to go to 3 right now for this problem so this is the laplace equation these two are the this is the combination of kinematic and bernoulli equation this is the bernoulli equation itself that's volume conservation those are basically symmetry conditions and suitable conditions applied at the axis of the cylinder and those are initial conditions okay so this is after we substitute this now let's move on now we are going to do do a modal decomposition so we say that all these uh, our basic unknowns are eta i and phi i i takes the value 1 2 3 and so on and so at every or order we are going to do an infinite uh, expansion and our basis functions or our eigen modes of the system are basically this now i have to mention here that i have used the deep water approximation here this is not necessary but helps in Uh, drastically reducing the amount of algebra that we have to do particularly because we are doing a non linear calculation so we have taken the deep water assumption here which means that we are looking at waves whose wave length is much small compared to the depth of the pool on which it is imposed so with that we have this expansions and so the spatial part of all variables are imposed by us okay so this is a sum of basic bessel modes in the radial direction and exponentially decaying things in the uh, along the depth and this is the 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 perturbation of the surface this is also a sum of bessel modes in the radial direction and so the problem basically boils down to just calculating of these coefficients at various orders subject to suitable initial conditions now once we plug this in now i have to also mention that by construction we satisfy uh, this these expansions by construction satisfy all of these conditions okay and the laplace equation so the problem basically boils down to just satisfying these two conditions and these two conditions will basically determine what are those unknown functions of time so we substitute this into the equations and then we get this and then there is the spatial part so if we want to get equations for each of these coefficients we have to take an inner product with the suitable eigen modes that we do using orthogonality relations between bessel functions we basically obtain equations for pi of m and ai of m recall that ai governs the amplitude of the surface pi governs the amplitude of the velocity potential so at every order which is given by i we have a, m number of modes in the system okay and we have to solve this so these are just ordinary differential equations and we have to solve this these are linear ordinary differential equations they have been linearized because we have used a taylor series approximation somewhere in this calculation and so now we have to solve this at various orders 
Now the calculation is a bit lengthy, but this is basically the spirit of the calculation, and those are the uh, approximation. So it eventually boils down to just solving a simple harmonic oscillator equation at the lowest order, which is the linear order. The equation will be homogeneous. That's easy to solve. At the next orders, inhomogeneities will appear, and they appear because of nonlinear effects. Okay. So now I'm just going to summarize the linear solution. Okay. So what do we get at the linear order? At linear order means uh, i is one. So phi one and eta one, and we just get what we would expect from a linear wave. So we have perturbed the interface initially with a Bessel mode. And so it just moves up and down harmonically in time with a frequency which is given by the dispersion relation. This dispersion relation is basically the scaled version of the capillary gravity wave dispersion relation for deep water. And correspondingly, one can get a uh, velocity potential. This is this is known. Uh, this is very well known. Now we are more interested in asking what is the nonlinear correction. Okay, so we are interested in order epsilon square. And so this is the order epsilon square. This is a slightly lengthy calculation, but I will just explain to you qualitatively what are the new features which arise. So as I told you earlier, in the nonlinear calculation, we get inhomogeneous terms, and they basically play the role of forcing terms for the uh, for the simple harmonic oscillator. So you can see that this is an order epsilon square contribution for the perturbation. This is this, this is just the linear contribution. This would just predict that the interface would move up and down harmonically in time. It would not predict a jet. It would not predict a dimple. Now let's look at this part. This actually says that there are three terms to it. The first term is independent of time. It's just a space dependent part. That's basically a correction to the mean level. Then you can see that there is this two omega q. As I told you earlier, q is five in this calculation. Q is an index for the primary mode. This is my primary mode of the system. I have put one mode in the system at time t equal to zero. That is my primary mode. Through nonlinear mechanisms, other modes are getting excited and energy is getting transferred into the nonlinear modes, the other modes in the system. So then there are these two terms. One of them is the is this, which is which oscillates with a frequency of twice omega q, and then there are these free modes which actually satisfy the dispersion relation and have the uh, dispersion and these are alpha k. These have wave numbers like alpha k and frequency omega k so this is qualitatively what nonlinearity predicts at order epsilon square now similarly one can get an uh, similar nonlinear correction for phi and one can if you remember the perturbation expansions we also had we have had also stretch time and so one needs to determine in order to be consistent up to order epsilon square one also needs to determine this omega this omega 2 is determined by insisting that there be no uh, algebraically growing terms in the expansion. So one has to eliminate the resonant uh, forcing terms. And with that, one can determine the numerical value of omega 2. For this calculation, it's a small negative number. Now, we are basically interested in comparing the predictions of this eta with our numerical simulations. So what I'm going to show you next is a comparison with numerical simulations. So what, we, what I have done here is I have just tracked the interface at the axis of symmetry of the cylinder. And we have just tracked. So what we have here is three things. Those dots are simulations. The red line is the linear, what would be predicted from a linear model. And the blue line is in up to order epsilon square, the nonlinear model. This is for sufficiently small epsilon. And so we don't see anything interesting. You know, It's just going up and down harmonically in time with a frequency which was given by the dispersion relation. So all three are on top of each other. Something interesting starts showing up when epsilon climbs to about 0.5 here. Okay. So you can see that the, the, the simulation and the nonlinear model are always together. The linear model starts showing small deviations. If you look at the interface at this instant of time, there is a wide dimple-like structure which has formed. At this point, the interface is actually moving down. So it's a trough which is actually going down but has a dimple on it. Now, this dimple kind of gets smoothened out when the, when the trough reaches its extremity and then it rises. When it rises again, it actually forms another dimple, but this time now it's 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 less wide than this one. It's much more uh, narrower. But now my order epsilon square theory cannot capture it. It's kind of you can see that the order epsilon square calculation basically smooths it smooths it out. And of course, the linear model can can cannot capture any of these things. So now let's push epsilon a little bit further, and let's say so. Strictly speaking, our epsilon is a small parameter. But we are just stretching it further to see how well it does, even if epsilon is slightly more than one. So you can see that it's not too bad. So again, this we have this dimple forming and then a very sharp dimple uh, appearing. And you can see that there is a qualitative match between our order epsilon square calculation, which is this blue line, and this simulation. Of course, there are features that it does not capture that you can see here. 
but you can see that the the red line which is basically the linear model is just a sinusoid which is just going up and down also note that the sinusoid the red line would always rise up to one it's normalized by its initial height so it will always rise up to whatever it started with it cannot go beyond that but the non linear model actually shows overshoot it actually rises beyond one this is the inception of the jet the jet has a well developed jet will not form at this epsilon the epsilon needs to be higher but you can already see a, a shoot up here after one oscillation so now this picture actually gives you a sense of what the interface shape looks like as a function of time so we have plotted all three and you can see that there are certain features that it captures quite well so for example this dimple is captured well by the non linear model the linear model just predicts a trough in the next step when the trough is rising the non linear model the order epsilon square model does not do very well okay so here it does not do very well but then eventually when the, the a jet like structure forms with a small amount of overshoot the non linear model again does much better and then the, the linear model is just going up and down harmonically in time so this is what we can get out of our order epsilon square calculation now it is important to understand why does the order epsilon square calculation miss the sharp dimple so as i said earlier it gets the broad dimple but it doesn't get the sharp dimple the broad dimple is formed when the trough is going down the sharp dimple is formed when it's again going up so it gets this but it doesn't get quite that okay so for that it is instructive to just plot you know so just do a modal decomposition of the interface so this is the instant of time when uh, the no, the non linear model is actually able to capture the sharp, the, the 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 broad dimple okay so it is instructive to just ask that what are the modes that are excited in the system at this instant of time just looking at the surface the shape of the interface okay so what we have done is we have just written it as a uh, dini series as a fourier bessel series and then you can calculate from the numerical simulations what are the coefficients okay so those are the modes which are present recall that our primary mode was mode 5 so at time t equal to 0 all my energy was injected into mode 5 Nonlinearity caused it at this instant of time. Nonlinearity caused it to transfer some of the energy into other than five modes. You know, so modes are less than five and mode more than five are excited. Now note that the nonlinear models, so these blue dots, are the nonlinear model energy predictions. So our nonlinear model basically gets the energy reasonably right. So we started with five, so it gets the, all the energies right up to ten. Now the ten is not a coincidence; it's a second-order model. It's an order epsilon square model. So it basically says that whatever is whatever we start with, it will get it correct up to two times that. So if I start with injecting all my energy into five, it gets everything up to ten reasonably right. But beyond ten, there is a drastic error that it makes. You know, so you can see that the simulation actually has surface energy here, but the nonlinear model misses out all of these things. And so this small structure. So at the next instant of time, you know, when the when the dimple becomes very narrow and when this trough is actually rising this is what the non linear model cannot capture this this for reference this this is a very small scale structure this is about less than 1 mm in width and so you can see that there are a large number of modes which are excited you know so in order to describe this structure one will need actually a accurate description of energy transfer at least up to mode 15 so you can see that there is some amount of energy in mode 10 and mode 15 here okay so now that the non linear model cannot achieve because it's a second order model okay so it it gets reasonably right up to 10 but beyond that it essentially predicts that everything else is zero so with that in mind you know so Pratul, we said, yes pratul we have exit could you could you wind up okay fine so i will just uh, we, i will just show you some recent simulations that my uh, students have been doing and we have set up this because the structures are so small so we we, we have just uh, say, uh, restricted ourselves to pure capillary waves where too we have seen that such uh, such things happen such uh, dimple like structures happen and in the in a pure capillary wave calculation it is more feasible to go up to a third order okay so this is a calculation for the third order and uh, here i can clearly see so this is actually the small dimple which is formed while rising and you can clearly see that the second order theory does not manage to capture it but the third order manages to almost get it right you know and so this is the energy transfer so this is a third order calculation that we have recently done and uh, I, i will end the talk with this slide uh, it is known from the literature there is a uh, there is a large body of work on cell similar uh, the cell similarity of the nature of the bubble collapse there, there some of the recent papers that i have uh, highlighted here 
and so we have also recently shown that uh, this the evolution of this dimple is actually similar and these scales were originally proposed by keller and mixes but a lot of work has been done uh, in recent years in particular there has been a lot of study on the effect of viscosity on this okay so with that i will just stop here and that is uh, what i wanted to talk to you about today so thanks a lot Right, I guess we have time for maybe one question. Yeah, any any questions? Uh, any can you, people hear me? Yeah. So Rathul, we have exceeded the time. So, uh, uh, so maybe we should. Wait, yeah, sure. uh, yeah, uh, yeah. We have we have uh, one question by Luke. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you you mentioned you did you try to look at the effect of viscosity on the on the similarity scaling that you're showing here? Uh, not yet, not yet. But that's something that we uh, propose to do soon. But you know, we were in fact looking at some of your papers uh, on that uh, your recent PRL in 2018. That what we were looking at recently. To, see what is the effect of viscosity but we haven't done it yet okay thanks yeah thanks a lot um if if there are no more questions then we'll thank rathul